Hey, how's it going everyone? This is why I am here. In today's video, I want to talk about my new editing PC. This is actually a pre-build, but I did tinker with it and I'll get more into that. But today's video is about some misconceptions about what you need in an editing PC because I was caught off guard doing this. My first PC was actually much more expensive, but I really invested money in the wrong places. In this one, I invested money in the right places and just going through a couple of compiles going through a couple of timelines, I really see a noticeable improvement and it cost me severely less. So the things that I wanna to talk to you about today is number one, is a pre-build always gonna be more expensive than building your own computer? A lot of people get this wrong. They always think that building your own computer will save you more money overall. And this one actually comes out to be cheaper having it pre-built for me and then letting me tinker with it to get it to the way I want. It's one of those deals where most of the time the people are right. If you go with a pre-build, you will pay more, but there are certain times of the year where pre-builds will definitely be cheaper than building your own. This is just one of those facts. You just have to be really smart about it. Second thing I wanna talk about is where you should spend your money on components because a lot of people get this wrong. I was caught off guard on this and I just wanna set the record straight and I can show you a few examples of this and this will apply for most people. So before we get into component selection, I just wanted to share with you the cost of the PC. It's actually $1,410, which is very reasonable compared to what we actually got in components and having it already pre-built with a two-year warranty. There are a couple of caveats that I want to share first. Number one, the video card that I got with it is right here. It's a very cheap budget video card, really not useful. Uh, if you want to do basic editing with it, it should be more than enough but I already had another card, so I went ahead and slotted it a used card that I already had. Also, it came with a thousand watt power supply, I actually added in 850 because I, again, had this already handy, and it's also a platinum rated, which means that it's more power efficient. It's a little bit more quiet, which is something that I wanted, so I went ahead and swapped the power supply. The GPU swap was actually something that probably is needed because this is a very cheap card. The power supply swap isn't something that you needed. The reason why I wanted to talk to you about that is because for the most part, when you actually go with a pre-build, they're always gonna ding you on two specific things, sometimes three. The video card is the one where they're probably gonna overcharge you the most. So if you actually have a card that you want, you can probably buy it separately and put it in yourself and save yourself a ton of money. You can always find the GPU a lot cheaper than what the manufacturers of this particular PC will sell it to you as. The other thing that they usually ding you on is the memory. So it's one of those things where there's right now 16 gigs of memory in there, but I'm actually want 32, but I'm actually waiting for their $50 gift card to come in. I'm gonna use that gift card money to buy the other two sticks because then I can actually get a nice discounted price on memory to bump it up to 32. So at the price tag of $1,410.75, if I were to buy all of the same components that came with the system, which means buying this video card, not this one, it would actually cost me over $1,500. Whereas with this pre-build, I had everything tested, built together, and I also get a two-year warranty. So there's definite benefits into actually getting a pre-build, so long as you spend the time to actually research this. In order to get this particular build down to this price, I was actually researching components, looking at all of the vendors, and then you actually have to go buy the computer within a two to three day window period during you know the Thanksgiving season to get you the most discounts. Keep in mind with the $1,410, this is not including the fact that I got a free game that I could sell for you know $30 to $40, a $50 gift card, which I'm gonna be using to get additional memory, and also a gaming keyboard that was actually pretty good. They say it's a $100 keyboard, but it's more like a $60 keyboard, but it's still a very good keyboard that I got for five bucks. So I also got additional benefits besides the computer. So there's a lot of benefits to getting pre-builds. As long as you buy at the right time and you're very patient with it, it's very important that you actually know what time to buy. Nowadays, because of the competitions, there are plenty of manufacturers out there that are super competitive with their pricing as opposed to building your own. A couple of interesting things to note is that had I wanted like a 1070 in here, I could have went with a 
cheaper cooling system that would have been just as almost just as good i would say about 99 percent just as good you can easily get a all in one unit with a big radiator you just wouldn't have this reservoir and the motor down here to actually power the whole thing but there are some pros to this and we can get into that a little bit later on but you can definitely have a cheaper cooling system take away some of the led lights and you can easily get an nvidia 1070 into here for about probably 1450 so you can still get a really high-end computer with all high-end components but still not go over the two thousand dollar price tag which is very easy to do with these high-end computers so one of the biggest misconceptions about your editing pc is you needing a really high-end graphics card because it's going to be the workload for your editing what and what i have found out after editing for an entire year which is basically four videos every week is that the video card isn't as important as what most people say. Now it is actually important to have a video card in there because it does boost performance. I'm not saying you can actually go without a video card, but you don't need to go with a high-end one or something that's way excessive. I actually bought a computer where I had two NVIDIA 1070s in there in SLI, and what I found out is that they hardly get used. I was getting four to eight percent utilization on my 1070s. On this one, I just tested it with a whole bunch of exports. I'm using about 15 to 18 percent. As you can see, it's not a whole lot. A mid-range to even a low-end one can cover that easily. So it's something that you should really think about. You don't need a high-end graphics card in there. If you want to put one in, by all means, go ahead and do it. I have a high-end unit in here, mostly because I purchased it used on eBay for a really good price and I already had it on hand. I would actually go with a Radeon unit just because I have had quite a lot of trouble with the NVIDIA cards for really long edits like my podcast, which can be about an hour, two hour long. They just keep crashing at certain points. So I'm trying the Radeon cards to see if I actually have the same issues. So far, I can avoid most of the issues that I'm having with the NVIDIA cards, but this is more of Adobe's fault. Their 2019 editions of Adobe Premiere Pro, it runs terribly and it crashes a lot. I totally blame this on Adobe, not any of the hardware from NVIDIA or Radeon, but I have noticed that it's much more stabler with the Radeon and OpenCL, so that's why I'm going to go ahead and keep this card and keep it like this. Do I need a card this large to actually run my editing? Uh, I'll show you some few benchmark. The answer is no. Pretty much any mid-range card, I'm talking around like maybe $200, will be more than adequate for anybody who's doing any type of YouTube editing with only very light to moderate grading because you need to grade and add a huge number of effects for the video card to actually be worth it to put into your machines. Trust me, you'll see that if I didn't actually have this card already on hand, I would not have purchased a brand new card for more than $250 to put into this editing PC. One of the things that you will see when we go through the component selection is that this is not a budget build. This is a pretty high-end computer at mid-range price. There are a few areas where I cut costs, but there are areas that I know I can cut costs and I can upgrade later on. So the first thing that you'll see is that this case is a very open case. This is just how I like it. At the core of almost any computer is your CPU. And this is where I did not skimp. On there is an Intel i9 9900K. So it's the fastest consumer grade processor that they have and it can be overclocked. For me, I overclocked it a little bit, but then I kind of left it there. It's not anything severe. We can get into that a little bit later on. But CPU selection is super important. When I first started this, I actually wanted a Threadripper. I wanted a 16 core Threadripper. Unfortunately, when I was actually pricing out the Threadripper and the Intel, the Intel ones consistently came over $200 cheaper because it was just more heavily discounted over the Threadripper because the Threadripper isn't a super popular chipset for gaming. So for this particular case, I went with a i9 even though I wanted a Threadripper just because of pricing. One of the things that you do want to spend money on that's super important is your hard drive space. Specifically, you want to use the new MVMV interface for your SSDs. So the SATA inputs down here, they have been your staples for a very long time now. 
they are no longer any good. The NVMEs are vastly superior. You should not use SATA ports anymore. You should only go with NVMe interfaces and whatever SSDs that come with that. If you want a mechanical hard drive, you can definitely put one in with SATA. But personally, I only use portable uh, USB mechanical hard drives for my backups and long-term storage because at USB 3.0, they're more than fast enough for that. And I don't clutter up my build with having a mechanical hard drive in here. Portable hard drives just tend to be more utilitarian. There's just a whole lot more uses to them because they're very portable. So I really like that. So for storage, I actually have two NVMEs. The top one right here is for my operating system. And the bottom right here is for my storage. So my OS and any application that I install onto my computer is up here. And any type of video editing files is down here on this one. It's just nicely spread out so that it's very easy for me to maintain. In terms of memory, uh, 16 gigs is definitely the minimum, but I would recommend going up to 24, 32 if you want to splurge a little bit. But I don't feel like if you're using Adobe Premiere Pro, 16 gigs is enough. You can definitely use more in certain aspects of exporting, especially if you're exporting in 4K. It does suck up quite a bit of memory. So I'm just waiting on my gift card to be able to add in two more slots so that I can get it up to 32 gigs. This particular motherboard that I have right here is an Azurox Z390 board. And overall, if you would say which component is the most budget component in there, it's actually the motherboard, but it's still a gaming motherboard. It does very well for itself. All of the benchmarks shows that it definitely can keep up, but it's more than adequate right now. If I actually added more GPUs in or more SSDs, then I would actually have to upgrade to a more professional board. And for my particular case, this is the reason why I chose a budget gaming board. I would actually want to upgrade to a more server oriented board where there's just more PCI Express lanes, not more of the gaming stuff where they give you a bunch of LEDs and overclocking features. Those are features that I don't really need. What I really need is express lanes and those come with server boards. This is the reason why I didn't really invest a lot into the motherboard. This is also the reason why I didn't go with any hard loop cooling because if I went with a hard loop and I swapped out motherboards, then none of the fittings would fit. But with these you know, loose tubes, I can easily adjust the reservoir up and down to give me more length so that I can actually move the CPU block anywhere I want, giving me greater flexibility in the future should I swap out boards or any type of CPUs or anything like that. So that's super useful. I went with a high-end cooling unit, mostly because I'm an enthusiast. You really don't need to do this to get the best performance out of your 9900K i9s, but I like this. There are definitely a few benefits, but there are definitely a few things that you should know if you want to go this way. A lot of people are using the all-in-one units, the AIOs, in which it basically has the same setup just without the reservoir and the water pump down here. And the reason why they do that is because those are self-sufficient units. There's no maintenance involved and it's super easy to put in. The benefits to going with a reservoir and pump is that number one, there's a lot more water. So it's a little bit better in terms of cooling. The pump is down here. And what's really good about the pump being down here is that the pumps are usually much larger and they're usually much more efficient. The way this pump system works is that water is flowing into the CPU where it gets warm. The hot water goes into the radiator, loops around, and then comes back down into the motor and the reservoir. So what this means is that the pump actually never receives hot water. So cooler the water, better for the mechanism, better for the pump. It's going to last a lot longer than an AIO pump. So this is something that's really good. It's also pumping at a very slow rate. So again, without having to pump very quickly, it's gonna last longer. It's much more efficient. This is the reason why you would go with this pump if you're going to be practical about it. The unpractical side, the cool side, is that it's just very cool looking and you just might want to set up like this, which is the reason why I actually went with this pump. What I'm getting right here is that at idle, I'm hovering right around 34C, you know, like around 85 degrees. And at full load, I'm getting to about 74C. And this is with all cores probably at 4.9 gigahertz. And it's doing really well at 74C. 
I can easily bump it. There's plenty of headroom. The reason why I don't bump it is I'm not really seeing much of an improvement after that. And I like the idea of running a cooler system because all of the components will last longer. I'd much rather have a durable system over a really hot system that could potentially shorten the lifespan of a lot of components. Now, the downside to actually having a cooling system like this is that there is some maintenance involved. One of the things that they'll tell you is that the coolant inside should be replaced every year or two years. Personally, I don't really believe that. I don't think the coolant needs to be replaced that often. The major reason why you want to replace the coolant, and this is me being practical about it, is that you don't want algae to grow into your coolant system because there is a lot of warm water that's flowing around and the coolant inside here actually has chemicals to make it to where bacteria doesn't grow. So what I'm going to do, because I don't really believe you actually need to replace all of the coolant every year, is that probably every three months I'm going to go ahead and remove all of the coolant inside the reservoir and put in new coolant so that we get those new agents in there to prevent algae growth. In terms of cooling, I personally think water is water. It'll be perfectly fine without it. What you're trying to prevent is, you know, algae and any type of bacteria growing inside of your computer system. So just having new coolant in every couple of months, I think will be sufficient, but I will let you know long-term if that's true or not. Last thing to talk about is the power supply, which a lot of people don't think about, but really any gold rated power supply would be good enough. This one came with a gold rated power supply. I just put in a platinum rated one with a lot of good components because it was much quieter. It's more efficient because I have such an open case. Having something that's a little bit quieter makes a big difference for me. So that's the reason why I did it. This specific one right here is actually used unit. I bought it off eBay for $56 because Right now, since the cryptocurrency crash, there are a bunch of really great power supplies, platinum edition ones or platinum rated ones for very cheap prices. So if you're looking to upgrade power supplies to something that's more quiet and more power efficient, really good time to actually pick one up. The last thing I want to talk about, and this is something that's very cheap and very easy to do, and that's that USB fan right here. So it's a USB fan with a gooseneck and it's pointed right into this area. And what this area right here is, is this is your VRMs. This is the chips that power your CPU. It's really important to actually get active cooling onto these particular heat sinks. These heat sinks don't really need to be massive. You'll notice on a lot of high-end gaming boards that these are massive heat sinks. And the reason why they need them is because they don't have active cooling. But if you have any sort of active cooling blowing into these heat sinks, a small little fan with these heat sinks is more than sufficient even when overclocking. It's one of those things where because we're using this radiator type unit, there's no longer a lot of air movement in here anymore. So you really actually have to have something that blows in air right there. It actually makes a huge difference in your motherboard temperatures. This is something that's super important. If you're actually going to be using an AIO unit, I would definitely recommend that you actually look into finding a way to get active air cooling somewhere in this area and making sure that it's working effectively because it does make a big difference in your motherboard temperature and that's really going to affect the longevity of your motherboard. So that was a quick rundown of this PC or as quickly as I can actually make it. Keep in mind that I'm an enthusiast, so if you have any questions, definitely leave it in the comments below. But I'm not certified in any of this. I'm just an enthusiast. I have been building PCs for quite a while now, and it's a lot of fun doing these type of things. And I have been really impressed with this PC. Two things that I've been the most impressed with is the hard drive speeds, these new NVMe SSDs. They are truly impressive. They are leaps and bounds better than the SSDs that I started off with. And the second thing I would say is the cooling system, just playing around with it. It's incredible how quickly it can cool. The i9s can definitely get super hot very quickly, no matter what you do, especially if you start overclocking them. But the cooling systems are definitely keeping up. It's something really interesting to see how far along that it has come. It's basically a car radiator at this point, cooling our CPUs. But at the same time, you don't really need to go that far to actually get a high performing PC. But it is a lot of fun as an enthusiast to get in there and tinker with a lot of that stuff. Anyways, that's all I have. Thank you so much for watching and I will see you in the next video.